146. Welcome back to the podcast. This is episode 146. This ought to be pretty good. This is your boy, East Coast Trev, and... This is Steve. What's up, Steve? Oh, uh, at this point, it ropes and ladders. Everywhere yeah, right. from 12 to 24 <laughs> feet. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. It's hot as hell. You guys, I mean, what's it What's it down there, like 100 and something degrees? We've been holding pretty tight around 85 to 90, but the humidity mm -hmm. is crushing, man. It's stupid. And, it, and you know, all the off-season chores, it's that time of year, playing with new toys and oh, yeah. everything else and, like, getting your mind right and, and trying to do those things. So it definitely makes things a little bit tough when it's this hot and nasty out. Yeah, it's it's now a matter of convincing myself to go through it and deal with it because after about half an hour, and I got to change clothes, I basically showered in my own sweat. <laughs> it's nuts, man, like working on food plots, getting out – cell cameras checking cameras i mean it's just constant in the bush work and it's just absolutely nasty you try and get everything done by noon well, um, especially when you're doing it on foot by hand you know mm -hmm. I'm, i've gotten lazy in the last two years and everything's tractors and we can get around you know but you're still out there hiking the mountains trying to do this by hand that ain't that ain't fun no, it doesn't make things very easy. And it, it, I mean, it is what it is, you know, but you just kind of put in that sweat equity, like literally. Yes, sir. Kind of, kind of try and get it done, you know, but it's, it's starting to pay off. You're starting to see some really cool things. And it's, I'm definitely doing a lot different things than what I have done in the past and starting to already see the results. So it's, it's definitely a great thing. Great feeling. Nice. Getting yourself I know that, set up for that, uh, quick early season setup huh hopefully i mean it you know as we all know i mean it and as we've all learned in the past i mean when those deer go hard horned it's a different Oof, ball game goodbye. so you can you can do what with what what you want they're definitely around and you see them and you know that they live in the area but they're not on that same pattern i mean they're not coming out at one o'clock in the afternoon right to hit a mineral site it's just that's just the way it's not and you know, just trying a lot of different things and learning a different different technique, um, you know, doing, you know, setting up the the cameras in July um, and and getting them on mock scrapes and learning a lot about it. You know, doing vine sets and hemp sets and this kind of thing and kind of messing around with a couple of different things. Um, it's just different, man. It's just totally different. And, you know, we have an upcoming podcast uh, next week just on that on mock mock scrapes and scents and the early summer stuff. And so, you know, and after having Jake Bush on and kind of learning the early season thing, it kind of gets your mind turning just a little bit differently. Yeah. We've, we've got a pretty good little series going here of uh, early season prep work. You know, yeah, Jake on there and we have this one talking about what you should be preparing for now and working on your climb and things like that. And then next week getting into, you know, all the different things you can be doing to enhance that early season hunt. So kind of cool. And it's all those things that you, you know, that you should know, you know, cause everybody, I mean, what does everybody kind of think about? They think about trying to get out, you know, in October, November, but you're, the ball has already been rolling. And I think that you're, you're 10 steps behind. You're trying to catch up on it. And I, I think that not really separates the men from the boys, but it definitely separates a lot. You know what I'm getting? You know what I'm getting at? Oh, yeah. Like it's, it, well, I, it, it's I don't know about world. you, but I like being able to go out open a week and put meat in the freezer and have that assurance, you know, whether it's two or three does, whatever it is, just pile them up, fill the freezer because then I can enjoy and target the rest of the season and not worry about meat. Right. So putting all this in my favor and going, okay, well maybe I can, get a target buck and some does 
all in opening week, mm -hmm. you know, that could turn someone's season around because now you're yeah. motivated for the rest of the season. It's not a, oh, well, I'm not seeing what I want. I haven't got anything. It's more of a, hey, I, I got meat. I got something I already wanted. I got something I could show off already. Look at me. Now I can just focus on whatever it is I want to focus, whether it's a big buck, where whether it's a number of deer, you know, you can shift that focus because the stress is off your back. Absolutely. And, you know, even, you know, going along with that, not even just getting that target buck ready for the early season or, or the, you know, where you want to be to try and put meat in the freezer for the first week or so. I mean, having your gear and the proper gear and having it all set up and, and in building that climb. I mean, that's what this podcast is all about is, you know, we have Matt on to kind of tear through, you know, some of the, the saddle hunting basics from the start. I know, you know, there's a lot of people that talk about it and it's been like, you know, we're kind of at the top of the curve now where it's kind of really caught on and guys have really wanted to be part of it. So we've kind of started this podcast with Matt as a part one of tearing through saddle hunting. So you guys know where to start for you guys that are newer to it. And then we'll kind of sequence it on from there. Right. So think of this as 101. The next one will be 202. The next one will be 303. You know, <laughs> is that we'll a call thing? It Saddle Hunter, Saddle Hunter College. <laughs> so, yeah. You know what? That, that could be a really good thing, right? <laughs> yeah. It, it's This week will definitely be a wake up introductory type episode, the basics. I mean, we even flat out tell you don't worry about this, that, and the other thing because it's not applicable until you know the basics. Absolutely. And I think that's what a lot of first time saddle hunters really need and even some of the seasoned guys you know you always go back to the basics but the more we get into it we tend to forget some of the simplest stuff and you know it's it's funny that you bring up that point because it's, it's something that i think about a lot like and i've always i've always talked about it a million and one times with like your hunter safety course right so you take your hunter safety course and then i think that there should be a refresher course throughout every five or ten years to get back in that groove of things, because I think that we get lost in our minds of like the rules and regulations because a, they change a lot or B just to kind of take it back to the basics and kind of refresh yourself. It's kind of an importance thing. So even a podcast, you know, even if you guys are advanced pot, um, saddle hunters, <laughs> podcasters, if you're advanced saddle hunters, this is actually a really good podcast for you to also tune and, into. Yeah. Also. Don't get me wrong. There's a ton and a wealth of useful information in this for every level. You know, we, we do talk about some technical pieces and parts, but we also go into some of the history. We go into some of the methods, some of the reasons, you know, best practices. So this, it applies to every saddle hunter, new and old. For sure. Absolutely. Well, why don't we tear through the sponsors and the friends of the podcast and kind of get this thing underway so we can actually tear into it. Let's do it, man. All right. First off, we are presented by Huntworth, huntworthgear.com. If you guys haven't checked it out yet, um, their camo is absolutely phenomenal. We used it in early season. We are dying to use their later season stuff. Um, I know that there's a video coming out about their camo from us here soon. I know that it's in the works. Steven's been putting in a ton of time and effort on it. Uh, we tore through it. Steven goes from A to Z on the Huntworth gear. So check those guys out, huntworthgear.com. We do and will have a promo code soon. So just stay tight with that. Bowfishing Magazine, bowfishingmagazine.com. For you bow fishermen out there or non-bow fishermen, something cool to read in the off season, go on and check out bowfishingmagazine.com. It's an online virtual magazine. Tis Noise the, the game calls. Yeah, it is. It is the season. I should be there now, I right? I, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little upset. You, you got laid out. Sean's killing it, but you know you'll make up for it next week. Um, also, Nor'easter Game Calls, NorEasterGameCalls dot com. Guys, the Jurassic series is in the making. Um, there is going to be a limited number. I think that we are. I think sixteen or 20 i'm not really sure so they're going to go very fast a little bit higher end a little bit more expensive i mean they are mammoth ivory um so you guys keep keep your eyes out and you guys will all know about that um check out our social media platforms for that uh friends of the podcast uh latitude outdoors latitudeoutdoors.com uh they make the method and the classic two they make the method and classic one also but the ones running right now are the twos uh great pod i mean why am I keep doing that? I'm not really sure what is wrong with me right now. 
Um, they're great got a saddles. Lot to do tonight. <laughs> yeah, I know it's it's you're always thinking right. So, um, but they're great, great saddles. Very comfortable, very versatile when it comes to um, saddle hunting. Um, being the two part panel, you actually have magnets to kind of step them up out of the way. Then they're more like a like a kidney belt. Uh, when they're walking in so they're a little bit easier to use so go and check those guys out latitudeoutdoors.com we have them coming on here at the end of the month so to release some of their new new products so keep your eyes out there uh, check those guys out latitudeoutdoors.com zeus broadheads new era archery um that is the home of b16 uh zeus broadheads um steady the, form steady form uh did i say b16 yeah yes. probably <laughs> um i think the aries uh they got a lot of cool stuff over there and they got a really nice beautiful broadhead coming down uh down soon and it will be released soon um and last but not least vital grounds outdoors and that's what this podcast is all about so you guys can hear about them here now yeah but we do a kind of a, i'll be honest we do a very light limited job kind of digging into vital ground yeah <laughs> there's there's so much more behind the scenes that this company does um all I'll say is you can go to the Novix mini sticks to get a sneak peek of some of the equipment we use provided by Vital Ground. And there's way more on his website, and he's got a lot going on. He touches on it at the end of the show, so stay tuned if you want more information. Listen all the way through, get to the end. He'll touch on it. We will get more information on the full spectrum of what he does in part 202, just just because we got a little carried away in this one. Absolutely. Well, while we're at it and we're on a roll, why don't we get uh, the man himself, Mr. Mike Salter, on? Let's get caught up on what's going on in the world. Bringing you the news for the cruise is our good buddy, Mike Salter. Take it away, Mike. Hey everyone, we're going to start this one off in Maryland, an opportunity for anglers to cash in for harvesting invasive northern snakeheads. Maryland DNR and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are placing blue and yellow tags on snakeheads in, snakeheads in the Chesapeake Bay and Blackwater River. Snakeheads har harvested from now through 2024 could be rewarded with gift cards of $10 to $200 depending on the tag. Uh, in order to qualify, anglers must report the tag number to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at 1-800-448-8322 and are asked to take a photo of the harvested and tagged snakehead. Now to Wyoming, where longtime moose and bighorn sheep applicants might have a much better chance uh, after a new proposal. Currently, unsuccessful hunters obtain a bonus point and an additional chance at drawing a tag the following year. Under the new proposal, the number of bonus points a person has will be squared each year, meaning that a hunter with 10 preference points would have 100 chances to draw, uh, as a new applicant would only have one chance. Uh, this will decrease the chances of new applicants drawing a tag, but significantly increase chances for long-time applicants. The weighted bonus system would begin in 2025. The recommendation is scheduled for further discussions at upcoming legislative commission meetings, so hopefully there will be more on that. Uh, now to Iowa, where a bill has been passed adding a new deer season. The new bill would allow hunters to use semi-automatic rifles to hunt antlerless deer in January if counties still have unsold licenses um, to hunt them. The bill also allows the use of 223 caliber ammunition. Uh, however, there are concerns about using rifles such as AR-15s due to the capable range of the rounds. Uh, the bill allows hunters to use rifles and ammunition already allowed in neighboring Minnesota, Missouri. So another great opportunity to harvest some additional deer in Iowa. Uh, now to Illinois, where the deer hunters will now be allowed to use single shot centerfire rifles for deer hunting after the governor signed House Bill 4386. The change includes uh, single shot center file fire handguns and rifles and revolvers. Center fire single shot handguns and rifles are limited to bottleneck center fire cartridges, 30 caliber and larger with a case length not exceeding one and two fifths inches or a straight wall cartridge, 30 caliber and larger. Calibers must be available as factory loads uh, with published ballistics of at least 500 foot pounds of energy at the muzzle uh, and the barrel 
of any handgun must be at least four inches. Uh, and the bill will not take effect until January 1st of 2023. Lastly, to Tennessee, where a series of significant changes to the 2023 season have been approved. Uh, the changes include a two-week delay in the general spring season opener to April 15th and delaying youth season to April 8th for spring turkeys. Uh, the special quota turkey hunts on certain WMAs will also be delayed two weeks. Uh, the bag limit is reduced from three birds to two and prohibits harvesting more than one jake. Uh, reaping and fanning will also now be prohibited on all WMA land throughout the state. The restriction prohibits hunting or stalking wild turkeys while holding or using um, for hunter concealment a tail fan, partial or full decoy with a tail fan, or a tail fan mounted to a firearm. Uh, also approved are loosened restrictions on species that prey heavily on turkeys, including extending seasons and bag limits for raccoons and opossums, and folding bobcat hunting opportunities into the statewide deer seasons. This is in relation to declining uh, turkey numbers across the state in hopes that they can get the population to rebound. So some significant changes there, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing this uh, across the board in some other states. So with that, as always, if you have any news to send along to me, please do reach out to me at Mike Salter on Facebook or Beard underscore Bow Hunter 21 on Instagram. And with that, enjoy the rest of your ride. As always, the news for your crews. Thank you, Mike. We really appreciate you taking that time to give us the news for your crews. Guys, if you guys haven't already, send him some news. A lot of good stuff going on. He it only has two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. So he can only do so much. So help him out. Send him over your news over to Instagram, uh, Bearded Bow Hunter 21 or on Facebook, Mike Salter. Or you can send it to us and we'll get it to him. Maybe, probably, maybe. I don't know. We'll no try. Promises. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. I like it. What do you think? I think we just dive right into this thing head first. Hope we don't land between two boulders. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> All right. Like somebody. <laughs> hey. All right. We're back on the phone with a good buddy of mine, Matthew. Matthew, 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 wow, Matthew, what up, Matthew, Matthew, what's up, man? What's going on? Uh, what's going on, guys? How y'all doing tonight? Oh, good, man. You know, just getting through the Trev's bumpers. <laughs> Got a butcher by name, man. <laughs> well, you know, I I didn't do the last name for a reason, and and I, when I saw when I. Not saw, but so when Trev's I thought on of meds, Matthew, guys. Yeah. <laughs> he's got an infection. <laughs> so when I said Matthew, I was trying to think of something funny to say, and it just didn't work out. So I'll just skip it, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, brother. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Um, why don't we start it off right, man? Why don't you tell everybody who you are, where you're from, and a little bit about what you do? All right. Well, uh, my name is Matt Katoya. Um, I am the owner and operator of Vital Ground Outdoors, LLC. Um, based out of Connecticut here, um, been, uh, primarily I, I deal in Amsteel, mobile hunting products, ropes, hardware, that kind of thing. Basically everything you need except for sticks and saddles. Um, and I've been doing saddle hunting for about 17 years, like solely. I haven't touched a tree stand in that long or a climber of any sort. Um, do some ground hunting, love to deer hunt, fish, you know, just get outdoors and enjoy the uh, everything going on, you know? Matt, you've really been saddle hunting for 17 years? Yeah, it, it's been that long, man. I, I, I look back at it, um, like old pictures and stuff like that. It, it's been a, it's been about that, that long time. Yeah. Dude. How, how long have we known each other for? Oh, oh, I don't know, brother. I mean, shoot. I remember, I mean, well, we actually hooked up. The only way I, I found out about you was through, um, back in the day, we had that ctbowhunting.com website forum. Um, and that's kind of like almost, I was already starting to deer hunt, but I was like, I was just starting out. Like I didn't start hunting until my twenties. So I didn't really have like a family member to grow up and like, you know, kind of foster me into it. Um, so I started reaching out to forums and that's how I met you through that forum. Uh, and I, re was, I remember you saddle hunting back then. Yes. And we all used to make fun of you on how, yes. why yeah. would you wear a diaper in the tree? That's the stupidest thing ever, but still not understanding the concept of what saddle hunting actually was. That, that That's true. Like, 
So I, I kind of, when I first started saddle hunting, actually the reason why I got into saddle hunting is kind of what most people do, like, and then naturally they get into saddle hunting because they feel it's safer um, because you're tied into that tree at like all this, you know, from the ground all the way to the top and back down again. Um, when I first started hunting, um, I used lock-ons. I actually fell from a tree 20 feet down I landed flat on my back and my head was like right in between two boulders where the ground met. So like if I turned my head left or right, I could have seen boulders. So I got one scared, <laughs> super yeah. scared, but I got lucky, man. I walked away from that. I was sore for quite a while, but, um, you know, and then I started thinking like, well, there's gotta be a safer way. Well, stupid me i should have thought well you know don't disconnect from your safety line in the tree that would be helpful yeah well uh, time out time out so how did yeah. it actually occur that you had fallen out of the tree i shot a deer and i ended up <laughs> like watching it run off and you know not knowing to just like let it go i'm like damn it i gotta see where it's gonna go because it's right by the property line so I was like getting down and I was looking and then I kind of was like, you know, I didn't let that adrenaline, you know, kind of fall off or kind of settle down a little bit. And I just misstepped and literally before I know it, I'm on the ground. Come on, dude. That's wild. Yeah. It was probably the scariest moment. Yeah. Scariest moment in my life, at least in my hunting career. I mean, I've had a few woozies but that was probably the most life or death well, that's nuts life. because you hear all of these tree stand stories or tree stand fall stories and they're kind of malfunctions of you know tree stands or steps or you know self inflicted um yeah. kind of but that is wild that and, and we talk about it all the time like after I had shot my buck like I was my adrenaline I, there was no way of moving and I bet you know, and you wouldn't, but you would never hear a story of somebody that had the adrenaline going and tried to get out of the tree stand and then, you know, had an incident like that. Well, there's always that yeah. joke that runs that, you know, you shot the deer, you disconnect and you step right off your stand and forget you're in a tree. You do. You know, yes, he, you're right. He literally did that only not quite as comical. <laughs> yeah, no, no, abs absolutely. Like looking back on it, um, like, I'll, I'll, I'll giggle a little bit about it because it's like, holy crap, man, you got like nine lives. You should have died because everybody you hear, no one ever comes walking out of that good. Um, all the stories you hear, oh. they either end up paralyzed or their careers are shot. Um, so, I mean, I am blessed on that end. I, I really feel that way. And it's kind of like what led me to saddle hunting because like I was like, well, I was always reading these John Eberhart books and stuff and like trying to like up my game as far as like knowledge. Cause I, like, I felt like I was behind at like in my twenties, um, starting off and, you know, not having all that information. So, you know, you just read it's research and obviously social media wasn't what it was then as it is today. So you didn't really have all these outlets. Um, but I saw, he was talking about a saddle. I'm like, what's that? And couldn't find anything online back in the day because, like, there was, like, nothing. Everybody had gone out of business. But he preached that it was one of the safest ways to do it. And I was like, well, I just took a dinger. This might be safe. Let's try it. Um, and I ended up finding, going through him, John Eberhart, to find my first saddle. Then he connected me to a saddle forum. And, you know, ever since then, like, because of that, in that, that in incident, I always preach like the safety of it, the safety of saddle hunting, um, just the safety in general climbing. Cause even lock ons and like mobile hunting with a climber or, um, even a lock on stand now is popular, but being safe is like the one paramount thing. And I mean, even today I still do some things that are kind of a little sketchy, but they're not, they're not as sketchy. Let's put it that way. I guess. I don't know. So, so you being as a new saddle hunter at that time, 17 years ago, how did you start? Like, what did you, what gear did you start with 
to get yourself up the tree and to start saddle hunting? Like, what did you do to learn about saddle hunting from the start to finish? Like, to start yeah, off, it was truly on uh, your own at that point. Yeah, I mean, there was a small community of us um, when I when I started researching before I got my saddle, um, and it was it was a saddlehunter.com forum, and it was just like. I want to say there's only like 300 or 400 of us like nationwide. And it was like a cult group, man. Like you want to talk cult group. It was a cult group of good guys though. It was like a giant community. And you know, you could find like what I used first was an original, like one of these old trophy line saddles. Yep. Um, they're huge. They're like, they were like basically like tents. Um, you know, talk about a diaper. Um, <laughs> you know, they were huge. Um, and then ropes, man, they didn't even ropes like today versus back then. I mean, be honest, Home Depot, Home Depot and Lowe's, we were stupid back then. Um, we tried to research Arborists, uh, you know, what they were using and our ropes were much bigger. They were like 13, 14 millimeters. They were huge, like boat anchor ropes. So, um, it was just kind of like piecing together what other guys had were, were, who had already been doing it because there are guys that were doing it years before me. Um, so it was like they spin you off to a product or a material and you'd go out and literally copy it and then find new ways to like do certain things. Um, I mean, I look back, the evolution of saddle hunting. Oh, God, it's, it's like like light years ahead now. Light years. And it's not even that long ago that this all had occurred. No, no, I would say. Mm, so, like, the the guys over at like Tether, they were really responsible for bringing saddle hunting to like the mainstream. Um, those guys, they definitely um, they went from like a you know basement kind of operation to like a global takeover. Um, and they kind of basically brought saddle hunting to the forefront of the arena where guys were like, okay, like there might be something here. And then that led to other companies coming out. Like, you know, uh, you have uh, like latitude and you have trophy line. Um, and then there's a bunch of custom shops that have opened up uh, who make saddles um, pretty much. And now it's, it's massive. It, it's, it's almost dominating the market. And that's and that's only occurred in the past five, yeah, three to eight five years. years. Uh, I really want to say I want to say even less than that, man. Um, like maybe three or four. You got to think like when Tethered first launched, they were the first ones to go mainstream because um, Trophy Line was like a name, but it wasn't a company again um, until right. they, uh, you know. So like those guys set it off, and then that led to like the revolution, like. Whew, everybody was like, now you had like trophy line coming back, which was awesome. You had latitude. They're doing some great things. Um, you had, then, you had tethered and then wild edge. Those wild two. Edge. An arrow. Oh. Arrow. An arrow. Hunter, I'm sorry. I, I, you know what? Let me backtrack a little bit. So like arrow hunter was before tethered. They were like the only saddle manufacturer. So like when guys were using like old school, like eBay, bought trophy lines um you know arrow hunter was an arb it's an arborist company um they do a lot of tree climbing they made like the first couple saddles there was like a kestrel arrow hunter even before the kestrel there was another one and i can't even remember what that one was but i know i had it and um then i did tether too <laughs> yeah then tether came out tether came out shortly after but Arrow didn't really bring them to the mass market like Tether did. Tether was right. like literally responsible for that explosion. Um, they started the curve of, of saddle yeah. hunting. Yeah. And then like that just led to like a great, like, I don't know if you want to describe it as like melting pot of craziness, like innovation. Yeah. It definitely then, like, launched the innovation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah, I get this. I get this a lot, man. New guys always ask me, "Well, what's the best saddle? What's the best this and that?" The one the that's problem, comfortable. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm. I, I I always say one that's comfortable. I say find find one that you like, then research that company. Make sure that that individual 
has like done their due diligence. They've tested their items. You know, they're using like climbing specific like materials. Um, talk to other guys. Um, the great thing about saddle hunting is there's something out there for everyone. There's not one product that best fits everyone. Um, at the beginning stages, I should say. Um, cause I've been toying with this for a while. Um, you know, we're all like in this industry and we all want to get kind of noticed a little bit. So we, we, we rep certain brands. Um, but I will say any of the major saddle players in the game, they make an outstanding product. They make a comfortable product. But once you get past like the 10 year marker in your game where you've like committed to the saddle, every saddle you can find comfort in just about any saddle um it's just what's comfortable out the box that's really a good starting point and, and some and, are more and what is the reason for that is that just understanding how the ropes work and getting yourself comfortable in that saddle i think i think that has a lot to do with it um like for me personally like i'm very like when i like i i get a lot of guys who ask me how do you climb how do you do this how do you do that and you i think over time you become aware of your body and what your body wants to move so you know like i think as you progress in your 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 built your saddle hunting career you'll you find out how your body moves certain ways how the ropes work you find the ideal locations you're able to read trees better so when you're hanging there you are comfortable you you can adjust um i think that's a leading into that kind of is like guys don't really try to adjust their saddle while in the saddle. If that makes sense. Right. Like they're trying to do that on the ground before they get up in the tree. Yeah. Like, I mean, when you're in a tree stand, like during the rut and you're out there for like 10, 12 hours or whatever it may be, do you ever stand up? You know, like you move to get comfortable because once you sit for a long period of time, you're going to get uncomfortable. Um, it's the same thing in the saddle. So just being able to switch and change like, you know, a slight body position or um, the slight angle of your tether or the length of your bridge, um, you can really maximize comfort um, and just changing like say an inch of rope in one direction will just make it feel slightly a little different if you've been sitting in that one position for a long time. So it's, I guess it's learning a lot about the system and it takes a while. It really does. And, and I think, I think that brings up a very valid point is it does take a while. So you can't go and buy a saddle in August and expect to be in the tree in September. Yeah. Uh, those, those guys, those guys kill me. <laughs> they, you can't, I, I, I let, let, let me preface that you can't, but I have the problem and I've worked for some of these companies and I've seen guys do the post postman drop my saddle off at 3 PM and I'm in the tree at five. And then the next like couple days go by and the same dude will make a post on social media saying it's the most uncomfortable thing ever in the world. Right. Um, bro, give it time, you know, <laughs> no, and, and <laughs> lay around with it. Completely yeah. nail it. Now, granted, like when I got into saddles, four years ago it was at that point in time where if a company had one in stock you couldn't get it delivered until you know the week before season if you were lucky so yeah. you were amped up and in a hurry to do it but the yeah. one thing i took away from that is that is the wrong time to get your stuff because if you have not practiced your climb and learned how to get comfortable how to set your ropes you know do you like that tether coming yep. off at eye level or do you need it a little higher or lower you know, I learned that the hard way because I didn't have time to practice. <laughs> so right now is the time you need to be getting your gear and over the next yeah. two months, getting your butt in trees. Yeah. I mean, so like hunting as a whole, I think has gone to like an, like an athletic standpoint where you literally train, like, like you literally practice now, like, I, when I first started guys in practice, like I know guys who showed up to the range to shoot their bow, like the day before the season. Yep. And, and it's like, then they go 
And they actually like those are the guys that like have like a 160 or 170 come by. Even you know, shoot, I'd settle for 150. Um, <laughs> right. you know, um, I mean, I, I really would. I mean, maybe even a 140, I'll pull the trigger on up here. You know what I mean? But um, you know, and then they miss or they hit the deer and they miss and they you know they basically gut shot it. I'm like, well, that's what happens when you shoot your bow three days before the season and then you don't shoot throughout the season. It's the same thing with saddles. You got to get comfortable. You got to get comfortable with your system. Um, and like what I try to tell guys, it's not about it's, – it's, it really is more of like a system versus a bunch of little tools. Um, you – you you gotta you gotta have everything all your ducks in a row um, like an order of operations. When I get to the tree, what do I do first? And then how how you climb up that tree? You gotta rinse and repeat every step, and then reverse it on the way back down. Or go ahead. Can I just time you out for one second? Because yeah. I think it's I think it's a perfect point to bring it back real quick. I want to make like kind of a checklist for the new saddle hunters. I mean, some of them that may be listening into this are already advanced saddle hunters and trying to pick up a tip or so on and so forth. But some people that may be listening to this may be new. So I'm sorry for the advanced people, but I want to make a checklist. So guys that are getting into say saddle hunting for the first time, what is something you need? Like you obviously you need a saddle, what do you need for ropes? You know, like a lot of people don't understand that you need a linesman and a tethered, uh, your climbing and to implement so on and so forth. So why don't you break it down? Like if you were a new saddle hunter today, what would be the things that you need? And then we'll just branch off from there. I feel. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Um, all right. Well, obviously you need to find a saddle. Okay. That's the first and foremost. Um, I would then after you get your saddle, figure out, yeah, you'll have to figure out whether or not you want to, and like the two rages in the game are, do you want to climb with regular climbing sticks or like my newest rage is the one sticking. I know it sounds kind of weird. It looks like a monkey, but decide between those two, between climbing, climbing sticks and one sticking. I think for the majority of new guys coming, maybe who have hunting experience or who don't have hunting experience, a set of climbing sticks is probably the best and most easiest way to go. It may be a little heavier, but it might be the most easiest way just to get up the tree. So debate on that. What saddle you want, what kind of climbing sticks you want. And then from there, when you buy your saddle, I would recommend going through a big, uh, like a, like a, ma a major saddle player, um, the one that sells you a lineman's belt, a tether, pouches, a platform. You're going to need those things basically to start saddle hunting. Now, from there, don't worry about all the social media stuff and who's promoting this and that. Worry about just getting those major pieces of equipment. Then from there, once you get it all, lay it all out and then organize it just make sure you get uh, comfortable with like what each item is and then what each item does and then you go to the tree and i as a if i was teaching a beginner um and you were just before you get into aiders and all that jazz set your stick to the tree climb up your tree put your platform on get in your saddle even, even if you don't want to use your climbing stick, put your platform on the tree, put your saddle on, and sit on that platform. Do, you know, start practicing from there. Right. I'm, I'm glad you touched on that because I was going to interject and say, if you're just starting, take one stick, put one stick on, put your yeah. platform, and stop. Don't go any higher. Exactly. Yeah, you don't you don't need to. Um, you really don't need to, Steve. That that's a that that's kind of like the core. Usually when I practice like and I practice year round, I will put my platform maybe like two or three feet off the ground. Yep. And I shoot from there. Because you really just wanna kind of I feel how it's going to feel in the tree because you're not going to, you're going to have that rope there, that, that, um, tether that's connected to your bridge. It's going to feel a little different. Right. Shoot the saddle is, 
it is a lot of guys would say it's just like a true stand. It really isn't. The angles are much more drastic, and the mo- like the balance points are a little bit different. You're right. not doing. You got to get those mechanics like, down. It's it's a different feeling. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed when I first started and I was shooting from the saddle, I was actually shooting a lot lower than, um, you know, the you know center center of the target because um, I always kept dropping my arm. Um, so it would always go a little lower. Um, so guys need to practice at those comfortable heights. You don't have to be 20 feet up in a tree to practice. It's, it's, a, it's insane. Like, I see it all the time. It's good to go up a little high and try it once in a while, but you can really fine-tune it from the ground level. That's I've never had a missed shot from the saddle. I made a bad shot from the saddle, but that was my fault. Um, just archer issue, but um, never off target that much. You know what I mean? Dear old duck, that's not your fault. It's a deer's fault. But practice at the ground level is key. So what are some of the benefits of, of, of saddle hunting over tree stand hunting? Um, well, I think being tied in from the ground is like the key component. Um, some will argue that a lineman's belt is not the safest form for climbing, but it is a body positioning device. So it relatively is safe. I mean, if you slip, it, it's going to grab. Um, so you might slide a little bit. If you were to fall, which I hope you don't, um, but it, it's definitely safer because you are tied in um, at all times. Um, you're not if you have ever disconnected in the saddle before you were tied in, say with like when you're climbing up the tree and you're using your lineman's belt to go up. When you would never, if you ever unclipped your lineman's belt before you set your tether, you obviously did not practice enough, and you're gonna probably pay a severe price for that. Um, in my in my eyes, um, but you would normally at the top before you took your lineman's belt off, connected your tether to your bridge, you're tied in. Same thing. The whole time you're up there, you're tied in. Um, you don't have to change like from I think like in tree stands. Do people still use those like thirty foot lifelines and stuff like that? Yeah, oh, I yeah. see them a ton. Yep. I see them a ton in public. Okay, you know, like and those things are great, but like. They leave you, like, you're always tied into the back, man. Like, with tree stand harnesses, you're always tied into the back. So when you, like, if you were to fall, it's think about where that's you around, going. and you're going to go spine first into the tree. Yeah, and never mind, people don't realize this, like, your climbing stick, man. If you took a fall and you spun around, yep. man, and you hit your climbing stick, it could <laughs> it could puncture you. Oh. Um, it actually happened to a guy not long ago. Um, he ended up slipping off his stick. And it was just enough to where the stick caught his spine. Ooh. Right. And the dude, dude, like, dude was, he's, a, he's, he's alive and he is well and he's still in the saddle. But he made a mistake, you know, and it was a learning experience for the community, I think, too, to be like, take your time. You know, that's kind of like. the well, And that was a, a big point that really got into the screw in steps. Cause yeah. could you imagine had that been a screw in step instead of a stick? Oh man, it'd be like a, a spear. Yeah, it, it's straight yeah. impale you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this guy seemed to have, he walked out, he crawled out of the woods to his truck and drove himself to the hospital. Jeez. Like, and I mean, he had a <laughs> spinal injury. The thing almost like, like impaled, hit, like literally shattered his spine. Jeez. And we saw videos of it and photos of it and everything. And, like, I mean, I'm like, dude, like hardcore, damn, that's crazy. Like it, it really is. And, uh, but that's the other thing too, that, that goes into play too, with these rook with like newbies and rookies, whatever you want to call them is like, they want to get up to the tree in like 10 seconds. Right. And it's like, you know, even after all my years of experience, I still take my sweet time. Yep. The, like, and I found over all these years, and I've I've climbed some crazy methods. Like, I mean, there's a lot of guys out there who tried the whole multi-step eater on a wild edge step. <laughs> yep. well, I I started that actually in my backyard because I remember buying wild edge steps from from Drew, and I ended up 
trying his single eater. And I was like, man, this is still going to take me a few more steps than I'd really like to carry. So, of course, in my brain, I'm like, let's, why don't we just throw a five step eater on that thing? And that started in my backyard. And, um, of course, like I already knew the balance point and how my body would move on the eater. So when I launched it and talked, showed a video on like Facebook, it, it like went off fire. It, it, it went viral and everybody tried doing it. And then next thing you know, there were guys posting videos of them kicking out and going left to right, literally upside down. And, um, I was like, nah, okay, man, that's probably like the hardest method. I don't recommend a beginner start with that method. Um, start with just your climbing sticks. Don't screw with aiders until you're like, until you understand what the saddle is and what your system's going to be. Take your time going up those climbing sticks. Never, never rush, you know, <laughs> slow, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. I was that's just going to say, that's, that's what, that's what that's Drew says all the time. And it's, it's one of those things that everybody asks, right? When, when they, when you say that you saddle hunt, everybody goes, how fast does it take you to get up the tree? How much more comfortable is it than a tree stand? And why should I saddle hunt over hunting out of a tree stand? And the first thing is with speed, like you don't need to get up the tree fast. If you're going up the tree fast, then you're making more noise. You're becoming way more unsafe and you're putting yourself in danger. You shouldn't be rushing up a tree anyways. You should be making a 100% perfect climb the entire time to get yourself safely to the platform. Yeah. Especially as you go up and hike too, man. Like, I don't know. Like, I would just say like, Think of a ninja, like, like, like the stereotype ninja man, like a ninja, <laughs> like, like seriously, like a ninja man. Like you never seen a ninja, like, like stomping feet, like running through like craziness. They take their time. They're stealthy. They, 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 they blend in when you're moving too fast. You know, like you said at the tree, right? Going up slow makes everything much more controlled. There's no sudden movements. Um, and that, that does a couple things. Like it keeps your weight and your balance all centered. So when you're climbing, it's just, you know, it's just straight up. Um, the other thing is too, is like, you're not making any noise, like you said. And two, like, if you're making too many big, big movements, I'm sorry. If you're trying to kill deer, big movements will kill you every time. Right. I, I mean, and you guys know, like even sometimes the smallest movement, like yeah it don't like, take much it do, it doesn't like they're crazy critters man they they see everything it's 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 wild so you know safety is always the paramount thing as a new saddle hunter you got to go slow um don't get caught up into the speed race man it's not right. worth it and, and that's yeah. kind of one thing that the way i would put it out there for people to watch that are just getting into this one way to judge if you're pushing too hard if you weren't comfortable the entire climb and yeah. when you get to the top, if you are exhausted or you're breathing hard, you went too hard. I mean, yeah. that the climb into a tree saddle should be pain-free, careless, easy. And when it's comfortable all the way up, you did it right. That means you got yeah. your climb down and you're just, you did it correctly. To that, you you should add the sweating part of it. Well, that's a great because point. then you're sent. Because if you're working too hard at climbing, which you you absolutely can, because as Matt can definitely attest to this, is when you're trying to climb, it's an athletic thing, like you had said before. Yeah. And if you're working out too much and breathing too heavy, like Stephen had just said, then you're sweating, which then sent. So why are you trying to rush yourself up the tree? True. And, and, you know, like, that's another thing too. Like, so I'm a big eater guy. Like I love climbing with eaters. Cause like it takes less sticks. It takes less steps, et cetera. Sometimes I will just hang out. Like if I'm in the mid, say like up here in the Northeast, like we're not built for that Georgia, Florida heat. Like when it gets <laughs> like 90, 95, dude, it's like 85 here today. And I'm like, it's too hot. 
you know, if I was to hunt early season and it, it got like this and even higher at sometimes, like if I'm at my second stick and I'm starting to sweat, I might just pause for a minute, just pause for a minute and, and just take them, take it in, you know, take the experience in, Hey, I'm, I'm a second stick up, you know, and I'm just looking around, you know, um, cause like you said, you know, the scent is another killer, you know, if you lay it down in the middle of your climb, once you get to the top of your climb, it's too late. That scent's already gone. It's already drifting off. It's going to catch that deer's nose. So just take your time. No, absolutely. And that, and that's and that's very important because in one of the things with saddle hunting, you know, like if you're in a climber, you're working three times harder. You can't really stop in the middle. I mean, you can, but like now you know you have that much more work ahead of you see but that also is a perfect segue you know in one more perk of saddle hunting as we've said multiple times is you you pick your tree and you hunt your spot you don't hunt a tree you know with a climber you need that telephone (laughs) yeah i mean it's got to be bear going all the way up and that's just a pain in the butt but this way you can literally go i need to hunt that spot and just grab a tree yeah I, I, I've, I have rarely found a tree in my, in my years that wasn't climbable. Um, if it was a healthy tree and it wasn't rotten or anything, if it was rotten, it's a no go, you know, obviously, but any healthy tree that you, you literally can climb. So you, you don't need the, and even some guys with like the hanging, the, the, you know, the, the hanging lock ons and all that, they can get into those trees if they're using sticks, but it's a lot more work because now if you got a lot of branches and stuff like that saddle, you can kind of sneak in cause you got less to like worry about. You're wearing your harness, you're wearing your IE tree stand, um, you know, so you can go around limbs a lot easier, but with a climber, yeah, you definitely need a telephone and that really limits your your ability to get to where, you know, you may actually need to be, you know, I mean, we all know in the game of deer hunting, sometimes it's a game of yards. So feet. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, That's, you know, yeah, we could go down to inches, man. I know (laughs) that was my problem all last year. Uh, you know, I ran into it where my season was like, uh, I'm going blind. I didn't have chance to scout and all that jazz. I got tied up in life. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do this like crazy. I'm going to just look at Onyx. I'm going to find spots. I'm just going to mark them where I think they'd be. And I'm just going to go in blind. And just hunt. And and just hunt. Like I didn't know Mm -hmm. where the hell it was, you know, what was going on, where the deer were. I just would say, that looks like a deer spot. Let's try it. The terrain features look great. So I went. And, you know, I was like 10 or 20 yards outside my shooting range, you know, like, I mean, each time, like I went out. So it's like, man, okay, cool. They were there, man. I saw them, but it was past that, you know, that 40 yard marker, you know. And and you bring up another valid point of saddle hunting is that you can do that. You can literally go into anywhere, not knowing what you're getting yourself into and have successful hunts, which you can do it with hanging sticks, right? Yeah, you um, can. But I think that with a saddle, it le- leaves you a little bit more versi- versatility where you can literally just pick a spot, go up a tree, and not have to worry about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the one thing that comes to mind when we talk about the differences between saddles and, say, tree stands, like those stick and lock-on uh, mobile hunters and stuff like that, but the one topic that always comes up is weight saddles. It's always the weight aspect. Um, I, I get it. You don't want to carry that much weight. And there's always that argument online, of, you know, my tree stand weighs 12 pounds fully set up and your saddle weighs 12 pounds with all your ropes and carabiners and all that jazz. The, the fact where, where people I don't see, don't see the big picture here is how well it all carries how you pack your pack, like how you set up your pack or your saddle or your stand, how that carries on your back or on your body is going to make a huge difference. You know, I've, I've had some packs in my day. I've had a lot of packs in my day that 
you know, you could put 20 pounds in and it felt like 50. And then you put it in a slightly different pack that was more streamlined or whatever. And that 20 pounds felt like five. So I really wouldn't get concerned with the weight. I would really don't get hung up on ultra lightweight. Even, even I do that when I market products, man, of course, I'm going to throw in there. It's ultra lightweight. It's, it's just a slogan, you know, um, that the industry uses like wide. It's kind of like game changer. It's, it's get yeah. the basics down, get your basic sticks, saddles, ropes, pouches, and just practice in your backyard. And became and become very efficient with the gear that you have and then yeah. build your climb from there. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you don't need the latest and greatest. You don't need to spend a ton of money. And, and that's what people do. You know, they get the B sticks or they get the shikars or they get this. And, and listen, I'm I'm me, Steven, you are all we're gear freaks. Down for the cause, but it's you don't need that, man. I could use a, a set of XOP or lone wolf sticks and just, you know, any type of platform that I can yeah. find and, Absolutely. and, and hunt, you know, like you don't, you don't need to be 35 feet in the tree. You don't need to have the, the latest and the greatest, as long as you have a comfortable saddle to get yourself yeah. up there and know your gear and use it. Well, practice, you know, Absolutely. and one thing I think that we kind of missed on too was the the how do you say it? I don't know like uh um the the way that you can shoot out of the tree you know like yeah. you you have like a two hundred and forty degree shooting you know bubble kind of um where you can shoot like if you were to set up yourself and have a platform and then you had like a kicker say a step or um you know like they use like the squ- the what are those squirrel oh squirrel steps yeah, yeah. The squirrel yeah. steps so, or a, so a ring squirrel of steps or and and yeah. be able to work your way so that you can have an offset foot on the back side of the tree now you have you know you open up a lot of of you know, shooting area for yourself. So those are the kind of things that you need to practice to make yourself a little bit more effective in the woods. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, I mean, it really comes down to getting, getting a basic system, you know, don't go spend a ton of money. Um, I mean, cause like you'll fall down this path that I've fallen down. And I mean, I've tried all the latest and greatest stuff and I've probably bought two houses, Two mortgages worth of gear. Um, and I know my wife will listen to this tomorrow and or whatever, and I'll be in the ringer. But I'm going to tell you, like, I have not found, like, there are some of, some of it is lighter. Some of it is better made. The, right. um, but it essentially does, like, like I'm not going to plug it, but a hawk stick works just as good as a you know bee stick um it just beast looks better it looks cooler it sounds cooler um it's lighter it's a stick it's a climbing stick call it what it is it gets it's what you, you want to get out of it it gets you up the tree if you're just if you're just getting into it and you don't know like like for me i'm committed like i'm 17 into this man like i ain't going nowhere right i mean I tried to stand, I tried a lone wolf custom gear stand last year, and I'll tell you, for a minute there, I thought, "Ooh, this is sweet, man! Like I like this." And then I was like, I felt guilty. My my <laughs> my, my, my my saddleness came out in me, and I was like, I can't do it. Can't, you can't cheat on your saddle. <laughs> I can't cheat on my saddle, man. We're, we're, I mean, we spend a lot of time together. We're so close. It hugs me, dear. Um, you know, I, I get your personal nut hugger. I, I really do have a collection of saddles, man. I I think like what this past year I sold like four, and I still have six or seven left. Um, so I have saddles, man. Um, that's like, but I'm I'm connected to all of them. Um, and I still buy new saddles from time to time. Um, but they're all like I use them all. Um, and they're all great. 
and I find comfort in each and every one of them. But that comes with years. So don't worry about that. Worry about buying and, you know, look at the reviews. Look at your peers, you know. Um, and, th- and that's one negative thing about saddle hunting, honestly, is that there's not like a shop that you can go to and try out any saddle. Yeah, that's that's the we've talked about that. There's a lot. There's a couple small shops or like a couple of the big name companies who are getting into like the retail kind of like in a mom and pop archery shop right. type of thing. But like. <laughs> You know, like the only ones that I think have made it to like the big dog areas are like the hawk stuff. Um, which, yeah, that's all commercial. Yeah, that's all commercial. You know, like I don't think the the the, the general public really knows like what it's like to be uh, an industry uh, manufacturer of products in the hunting industry. Like, insurance is the dictator of all. Um, like to get insurance for like, say for me, it's like, like a million dollar policy or maybe a $2 million policy per year to, and that's just for me to operate out of my little place and my house and whatnot. But to get into a Bass Pro or Cabela's, it's like a 20, $30 million insurance policy. Jeez. Yeah. Like, and I mean, you want to talk about like i don't know how like well i do i know how hawk does it they they have a, cr- a crap ton of products out there um and their yeah, but they're are- also an international conglomerate and paying them in the background absolutely that's it too man you're talking about like the group like latitude and tethered and trophy line these are some average joe working class guys blue collar guys who literally started from their basement may had a building and created their own empires you right. know they, they 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 are the working class men and you know guys in this game um so honestly like for me as an industry guy been around seen it from the beginning all the way to where it is now i hope they don't go to cabela's i hope they don't go to bass from I, I hope they don't sell out i hope they don't sell out big for corporation uh but aside from that, getting back to the point of it all is like, if you're a newbie, come on to social media, join some of these saddle hunting groups and see who's around you. Make a post, see who's around you. The one cool thing about, I guess, the saddle hunting community is kind of takes me back to how CT bow hunting was, Trev. And you might, you, you, you remember this. We were a, a small community that basically helped one another. You know, if a dude needed help or wanted to learn something, we would take that time to show them. Or, right. you know, and that's how saddle hunting, like when I first started, that's how that community was. You know, and as it grew, there were some pro, there were a lot of pros. I mean, like the innovation's crazy nowadays. Like I'm waiting for jet packs. That's my next thing. <laughs> like, I, I see these guys in like Europe, in the military, they're using these jet packs. And I'm just like, dude. I need one of those. Like, I'll just hook in, like, ready to go. <laughs> but, like, I, but like, saddle hunting was the same way. It was, like, a bunch of guys who just, they didn't, nobody ever knew what they were doing. They just, they had some experience, but they just tried to help one another get to that next level. Um, and there are a lot of guys like that still on social media. Um, I know it can be kind of hard to see sometimes because there's a lot of politics there, but, there are a lot of good people. So if you just jump onto these pages and you message or just put post out there, Hey, anybody in this area, do you got a saddle? I can try. I'd like to try it. doesn't matter what brand, just sit in it, try it, feel it out. There's going to be a guy who's going to say, Hey dude, I'm right there, man. I can help you out. Um, is there always so, is that that's one thing about the saddle community. Yeah. I mean, if you called me up and said, Hey, can you give me your best deer spot? It's probably going to be a no. But if you say, <laughs> I want to use my saddle, I'd be more than willing to let you use my saddle, you know? Right. <laughs> you know. Now, um, as far as places where someone who's interested wants to go and, you know, sit in one, fill one, maybe even get a little more information or some practice or get a full-on test climb, you know, 
where are the best places that you've seen to do that? Uh, well, like lately in the industry, there's been a bunch of, um, I don't know, Tethered has their teaching train events. Um, there's a lot of saddle hunter meetups going on all across the country, in like almost every state. Exactly. Um, and I mean, even I, I'm personally like, I've been wanting to do this for years and just, it just never gets around to it. But I've been for going up to Massachusetts for a couple of years now. I decided, Hey, in another couple of weeks here, we're going to host one here in Connecticut because there's a lot of interest down here. It's not that big in the Northeast, but there's always guys I'm interested. You jump online. You, hey, anybody got a meetup going on? Anybody got a meetup going on? If you can get out to like uh, a total archery challenge or um, there's an event coming up in July in Ohio, um, I think it's called Mobile Hunter Expo. They're doing a big thing. You guys can go in and try literally anything. And then these little saddle meetups, guys just show up with a like a buffet of gear. When when is your meetup, Matt? My meetup is uh, I think it's the twenty fifth of this month. Um, it kind of got thrown together last minute. It's going to be the twenty fifth at Gay City State Park in um, I think it's Hebron, Connecticut. If awesome. you jump over to Connecticut Saddle Hunters group um i've got a post up there i got to do some updating get the map out but it's it's those events are really cool because there's no pressure all you got to do is show up you don't even have to try it if you don't want to but anybody's welcome to come and that's the same across all these meetups it's the same storyboard just show up come out shake hands meet some new people if you want to try it guys will let you try it yep and I'd say for just a basic saddle fitting and to see what it feels like to sit in one, you can almost go to any trade show. Absolutely. Almost every one of them has, here's a demo pole, and we'll let you take a step up and then sit in it just to fit. It's about time that they show up at these things. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest. Now, if these, if these, the one, my one gripe about these trade shows are, is they've got to stop releasing products at these trade shows and then wait, waiting for us to buy this crap in August. Yes. Like going back to that. <laughs> yes. Like, I mean, if you're going to show up to the ATA, which is in what, like February or January or something like that. Yeah. Like, yes. yo, I want my stuff ready to go by like April, May. Right. You already prototyped it. You already showcased it at the largest show in the game. Like make it available. Yeah. I mean, there's some stuff I'm waiting on right now from like, and I'm like, yo, it's June. <laughs> July is next month. Even I want to get my stuff to go out and play. And, yeah. And that, and just, that goes back to my gripe and complain about, you know, if you get into it now and the company's out of stock or they're not released yet, you're not going to get it until the beginning of the season. In which case, in my opinion, you're too late. You are too late. You don't know it. Yeah. I, I think I, although I, I, I will agree, but I'm going to, I think in the light last year or two, I think COVID was a really interesting thing for like the industry as far as supply and demand. Oh, agreed. There, agreed. Are, there are a lot of like, it's harder to release a new product nowadays right now because the supply chains are really messed up. But a lot of these saddle guys, they're, they're super intelligent. Um, so they start their, they've really got their supply chain figured out. Um, I mean, it's not without say that they can't run into hiccups, but like, do yourself a favor, do them a favor, get it now, not, you know, September 14th when season starts on the 15th, you know what I mean? Um, like get it now, get comfortable and, you know, just just practice and and play so so matt now that you've taught newbie saddle hunters how to saddle hunt why don't you tell everybody a little bit about you and your product yeah i was gonna say what what you do bro Uh, (laughs) what do i do well um well aside like i said i run vital ground outdoors uh llc you can always check it out at vitalgroundoutdoors.com um I do some really cool stuff with Amsteel and 
Um, I, I do pretty much anything with Am Steel. Um, that game is really tough. There's a lot of cool people doing some cool stuff. Um, I've got some really cool stuff. Um, I'm just going to say really cool stuff. I got to play it smart here. Um, <laughs> I've got some new stuff coming. Um, I can't give any teasers out because there's always people watching. Um, <laughs> that's one of the problems with saddle hunting, I guess, yeah. right? Because everybody sees it and that's that. Ooh, let's remake <laughs> that. <laughs> no, we are like some Illuminati group or something like that. I have no clue, man. <laughs> like, we all like, hey, we've got something coming. And it's like, <laughs> it creates a massive viral cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're like, hey, dude, I got a secret to tell you. And you don't tell them the secret. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. That's how it works. <laughs> that, that's but no I, lie. I, I have some cool stuff coming. Um, as far as my company is concerned, um, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time. I, I've only been in business. I started doing daisy chains for a guy local now in Connecticut like two years ago. And, uh, you know, I just enjoy like working with Am Steel, working with people. Um, so I said, screw it. I'm going to, I'm going to do my own. And, um, I started this company. Um, I build a lot of cool Am Steel products, basically anything to get your sticks, platforms, um, on the tree, super rock solid aiders. I do some crazy, incredible stuff, um, that will get you up the tree, um, without, carrying like 20 sticks agreed um <laughs> yeah i think right um i mean you guys spawned that whole the whole aider thing with the novix last last season yeah um, if you yeah. guys want to see it get on youtube go look at the yeah. novix mini stick reviews and those are all covered with vital ground aiders yeah those uh that that video was sick when i saw that video dropped i was like damn my products look so good on video. They look way better than when I sent them out. Yeah, I, I think you actually got more coverage in that video than Novix did. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I was like, wait, whose haters are those? Those look really nice. <laughs> you know, uh, so it, shout out to you, Steve. You do some crazy camera work, man. I appreciate but, that, but you give us an easy product to work with. So yeah, you know, it, it's, it happens. It's Sometimes. Uh, what's the word? It's very camera friendly it's pretty uh, photogenic yeah. photogenic thank you yeah. um, <laughs> i like pretty <but>, better <laughs> purdy. I like that purdy. Purdy. but aside from uh am steel i i did uh expand my shop now so i do offer a lot of the uh, climbing ropes and hardware um like carabiners and stuff that you know the industry itself uses um where i separate myself i guess is how and it's not really separate myself, I guess, but I take my customers like satisfaction and service, like, I don't know, 200%. Like I'm all about giving back to my customers, giving back to the guys in the community. Um, I'm one of the only accessory am steel guys that does military law enforcement, first responder discounts. I do wholesale, um, I've got a loyalty program, which is like way cooler than Cabela's or Bass Pro. All right. <laughs> you, don't, say, you don't charge me an extra 4%. <laughs> no, listen, no, man, I give you, I give, basically it's a really cool program. Uh, it might be in this right now in a changing over from one computer system to the other, but we'll get that when it comes. But either way, if you come to my site and you buy something, all you do is you subscribe to it. Basically you create your own account. Um, like you would at any of these other places and you earn money back on your purchases that you can use towards future purchases. So like, you know, say you see something cool, you want it, buy it. You're going to get money back into like a point total. And then when I drop the next coolest product, you can come back and buy it, but buy it for even less because you'll have all that prior purchase built up. Nice. And I do have another cool program where it's coming out this week. I'm going to leave it at that, but it benefits the customer like 210%. Um, like I said, I'm blue collar worker, but I appreciate, I know none of our saddle hunters are living like the lottery life. Like we're not Elon Musk's, uh, you know, we're all working hard. Um, it's getting tougher and tougher to like, buy cool stuff because you know we're just <laughs> gas tanks are crazy right now 
Try right. scouting. <laughs> Try scouting. If you're driving around doing some scouting, man, forget it. So can I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah. Well, hey, like if you were out doing turkey, turkey scouting, man, and looking through fields and stuff, you know, you were burning through like three or four gas tanks. So, um, you know, uh, so like it's just another program to kind of get guys another advantage to get guys through the door. But I build all my stuff. It's all been tested. It's all bomb proof. And I think I was talking to Mardik earlier this week. I was like, he's like, dude, I don't need anything, man. My stuff is still good. I'm like, yeah, I know. That's the problem, man. Built is so good that you, you know, you're not going to come see me for another two years when it needs to be retired. He's like, I know. He's like, stop building great stuff that doesn't blow up. And I'm like, stupid, <laughs> man. I was like, good customer. So my motto is, is a dead customer is a bad customer because they never come back. They never come back. <laughs> That's, that's literally my motto, guys. <laughs> so I like to keep my motto, my customers safe, happy. You know, all you guys are like, I'm a community guy, so I'm not a corporate guy. Um, and I like talking to my customers. You know, I'll shoot you a phone call. You know, if you call me, if you email me, chances are I'm not going to email you back. Chances are I'm going to call you back and I'm going to walk you through whatever problem you're having. And then usually those phone call conversations lead me to what would you recommend or what would you like to do? You know, it, it turns into a whole like customer, like service, you know, Q and a, I guess you can say. So, so what are some of the benefits of am steel over regular, like webbed product? Like what, what would be the reason why somebody would come to you to outfit th- you, uh, them in, you know, am steel over the normal stock product that comes with the sticks and so on and so forth platforms. Well, I think like, like you mean like, like a, like the buckle straps that come with like sticks. Yeah. Um, well, one, none of my products that I use contain any metal. There's no metal, which saves on weight and saves on noise. Like you will, you can't make noise with my stuff. It's, it's completely silent. Um, any am steel stuff for that matter. Um, the other thing is, is buckles are sewn buckles wear a lot like the, like the loops that they, they use to connect the sticks. They take up more space and, and they do wear because it's sewn. um, not to say that am steel can't wear, but I've seen more issues with like stitches popping then am steel like a, a spliced loop that's done correctly it's gonna break at a much higher strength than a cam buckle right um and that's that's the other thing do you, are you gonna like like for example like a 3 like spliced loop is probably gonna hold 7500 pounds are you gonna put 7500 pounds on it probably not but that cam buckle is going to break like a 500 pound working load, maybe a 300 pound, 300 to 500 pound working load. My am steel is not going to break. It's going to be able to pick up your, your car, your Jeep, and it's going to be good to go. With, so, which a cam buckle wouldn't, wouldn't go that far. So no, why not no. have over, why wouldn't you overachieve? Well, I don't know if it's over, it's like overkill, but it's also lighter but, and it just makes more sense. Like why take the chance? Right. And, and it's funny that when you talk weights, it sounds like overkill, but when you're talking physical weight and size, it oh, takes up. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's a stupid comparison. You know, you can yeah. put four eighters in the same space as two buckle straps. Yeah, exactly. Kind of like, um, so like I, make what's called a psh it's a platform stick stand hanger it works literally across the board on anything that has like a versa button on it which is like a little round knob that thing uh when i when i made it i tested it out on a trophy line edp and trophy line was literally has literally the strongest platform on the market by numbers testing numbers um and uh, I put that on the tree, and of course, it wasn't like 
a third party test. It was a redneck engineered test. So I hooked it up to my tree, threw a crane scale on it, bunch of like tree pulling gear. And I pulled that sucker to 1100 pounds and it slipped slightly. And when I took the weight off, I checked it. Well, the only reason why it slipped was because the aluminum bar, the center post of that platform, literally kinked. It blew out the the basic the the bolt that holds the platform and the post together. Got it. at so eleven hundred pounds. At eleven hundred pounds, and that's just because it kinked that it slipped. Now that's four it, grown, five grown men, literally, and it's 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 up there like it would have gone much further i've seen i have a buddy who did his own engineer test on it where he just pulled it and it exceeded 23 so it's a solid product but it goes to show though that the am steel being lighter less metal is going to be stronger than basic aluminum like platforms that you're literally going to be standing on um it was a pretty cool test. I mean, again, it's not third party, so like it's not official, but you know, who doesn't like a redneck test? Right. You know, hey, if anyone can engineer something, it's a redneck. Yeah, pretty much. Redneck pretty engineering much. has yeah. lit- it literally saved Apollo thirteen. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, they're using it in space. <laughs> what do, what do they say? If you can't duck it, fuck it. <laughs> pretty much. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> but, but we need an am steel, an am steel version of that. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean that the possibilities are limitless, though. Uh, with like am steel to some extent. Like, I mean, there are, there are some there are some cons to it. Like I said, there is some abrasion issues that people may have because it is a softer thing. But it really is like a steel. It's almost like a synthetic winch cable. Right. Um. So I mean, the one thing about like saddle hunting that this can go from beginner all the way to like i don't care like a 40 50 100 year vet in the game it would be like you always check your gear you always check to make sure everything is like in tip-top shape i mean you can't expect brand new and use it like all season long and it be brand new at the end of the season there's going to be a little wear but to learn what's acceptable versus what's not acceptable. Right. So it's um, kind of like looking at your bowstring. You know, you know when the little phrase and whatnot yeah. wax is going to fix that. But then you see the one, you're like, ah, I better not shoot that until I change it. You'll yeah. Know. Like, yeah. Exactly. Like with am steel, like you know, a thread could pop. Like you could literally cut one thread and it's still going to hold. But you get through like two, three, three. Yeah. You know what? Don't even use that crap. Even if it's one thread, I would probably junk it and just make my, just do another one. But I make my own, you know, so, but, um, you know, it, it definitely is much, much stronger than your basically generic, like, strap material that comes with your sticks, your platforms, your stands. Um, mind you, those guys probably get those cam buckles for, like, two bucks a piece, three bucks a piece. So... Um, it's cheap for them to make. That's that's the other reason why. Right. Splicing splicing is like if you get a rope that's spliced, you're looking at a twenty thirty dollar hit on each loop. Am steel, you're not getting that much because it's it's stupid easy to do. But um, if you don't know the proper measurements, you're taking your own life in your own hands. So leave it to a professional. Come, yeah, come see me. Yeah. I'll take all I'll take all your business and I'll give you money back on it. You know what I mean? Like I'll do you right. Right. All the way. The the other one thing I really want to point out and highlight so people aren't getting all confused is it is not product specific. You can say, Hey, I have these sticks, I want an eight or and you can go cool. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I I go I'll try to go above and beyond. I mean, there's a lot of guys doing what I do. Um, there's a lot of guys who are just starting out trying to do what I do or do what some of the other, like, even like saddles, we have trophy line, we have tethered, we have latitude, we have all these bigger names. There's also names within the Amsteel community 
that do like, and I'm friends with most of them. I, I talk to them. They're all good guys. They all know what they're doing. So no knock on them. Um, we all try to do the same thing. We all do good stuff. Um, some of us offer different things. I'll tell you right now that none of my products are specific to one set of stick, one set of one set of platform, uh, stand, whatever. And if you don't like what I got and you want something else, I'll do a custom job for you. It's not a problem. Awesome. I'll make it work. It doesn't doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, no, again, it comes down to the growth of the community. Like, this is not about me making, like, I don't, I don't want people to think that I'm about making money because, I mean, I got to make money because I'm a businessman. But at the end of the day, I want to, I love saddle hunting so much. Uh, I love the mobile hunting community so much. I want to see it. I want to see it grow. Yeah. I want to see it be like, I want to see it dominate the world. You know what I mean? Um, and with and what want, you do, it's, it's, it's a major side in the innovation exactly and i want to see the community from saddle hunting to like mobile hunting just in general and i'll just like kill it at, at mobile hunting so i don't offend any crowds but uh <laughs> you know I, I i really wanted to see it grow dominate the world um people to like really appreciate what it is as opposed to like we came from where our grandfathers you know they were making two by four stands Look at us now. We're running and gunning all over the country. You know, yep. um, let it grow and grow each other. You know, again, my thing is community. Take care of your guys. Take care of the people around you, and they will. Their success will make you successful. Amen, man. I really do like it. So, one one of the things, what do you want to kind of leave all the listeners with? Like, what's one thing that you want to leave? If they can get one thing out of this whole podcast, what would you want to leave them with? Ooh. Take your time, do your research. Slow, smooth, smooth is fast. Don't rush anything. Do your due diligence. <laughs> I think it's pretty I like that pretty well rounded. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you need a sticker and it says Vital Grounds LLC and it and it's that. <laughs> That'd be a lot. That'd be a lot. There's, no, a lot going, there's a lot going on in my stickers already, man. Never mind. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I think that's awesome, man. Well, bro, uh, one of the last questions I got for you is uh, what drives you outdoors? Ah, it's a, it's a multifaceted thing, Trev. It's never just one thing, but, uh, it's that primal urge to get out and enjoy God's creation and, you know, take a chance to just learning new things throughout the world without the hustle and bustle of the city, um, the city life, get away from people, enjoy God's creation and just live it outstanding well guys make sure you go over and check out matt check out vital grounds get all your extra stuff you need there because he's been doing it longer than we've even known about it if you got questions reach out he's definitely a wealth of knowledge and uh i mean there's not a whole lot more to say than thanks for joining us matt it's been great uh thank you guys for having me it's, it's truly an honor Alrighty. Well, you guys know where to go. Go check them out. And until then, thanks for taking the ride right here on the Outdoor Drive. Outdoor Drive.